This episode of the Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review is brought to you by Draft. Draft is the best way, the most enjoyable way, and the most profitable way to play fantasy sports in a snake draft format. You can play football, baseball, hockey, golf, or basketball. Hit up playdraft.com backslash BQ to get in on the action with a free $3 entry upon your first deposit. All right, one to the two, two to the three, in the place to be. It's the Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review. And that's right, this is BQ, and I'm filling in for Adam this week. Out of commission for a little while, so um, we'll, we wish Adam all the best, and we'll catch him here again on the show in the future. So, Ro, what's up, man? Uh, these are some big shoes for me to fill uh, this week for Adam. <laughs> hey, what's going on, man? Hey, nothing much, dude. Um, back in the saddle, so... so uh, Hopefully I don't slaughter this, man. You guys have been doing a really good job with it, and uh, I've been enjoying listening to you guys. And Hey, we just, I just got to appreciate this moment, man. We get a special guest appearance by the heart of uh, the Impact Lounge BQ, man. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, man. Let's get into Impact, man. This, this was a pretty solid episode. Uh, but first, if you guys are looking for other good Impact Wrestling reviews to listen to, there's there's really several that do a great job. There's uh, the Heel Cast. I listen to them every week. The Pro Wrestling Personified Podcast. He also does a really good job. And of course, Andre Corbeil, who covers all the news much like myself. So definitely check those those guys out um, on YouTube or wherever it is you listen to your podcast. If you're on Facebook, check out the Impact Wrestling Fan Zone. That's, that's really the number one site for impact fans on facebook they do a very good job of moderating it i'm one of the admins on there so i'll post the stuff every once in a while and the impact lounge is now on facebook so if you just look up uh, facebook.com backslash the impact lounge we are right there in the place to be and uh the old page was the king of the mountain page and facebook would not let me change it so pretty much getting rid of that and it's a uh, impact lounge now so definitely check it out and yeah man ro uh what do you think about this one? I, I know you guys really liked the last couple episodes, and I haven't been able to talk about my thoughts on the episodes in a little while. I absolutely loved the last two. I'm sure I liked the ones before it as well, but I, I remember specifically I, I liked the last two a lot. But what do you got on this one? You know, I thought it was okay. Um, you know, if I'm measuring it on the past two episodes, um, it didn't stand apart. There was a lot of talking uh too much a little for my liking as well as the uh re the flashback that we got and we'll get into it but i thought it was all right yeah i thought the wrestling was continued continues to be really really good but i agree with you man that the talking segments although i did enjoy them they were just long like you know we'll get into it like you said um you you could have shaved two or three minutes off all three of those and it would have been a much better episode when I saw that GWN exclusive match come on or a flashback, throwback, whatever they want to call it, and it was the Feast of Fired, I was like, I cannot believe we're going to sit through a whole Feast of Fired. It reminded me of a couple months ago when they showed the whole uh, grand championship match between Eddie Edwards and uh, and what's his name? Rex. Aaron Rex, yeah. That was the worst match that year of Bound for Glory, and they play the whole thing. So th those are killing me, man. Um I think, from what I understand, a lot of the other fans out there. When have you been filling out the uh, the surveys? That impact. Yeah, I, I try every time they uh, when I see that they post them. I try, and I mean the times that I had, you know, it's been the episodes that I've really enjoyed. So I've just been telling them like, just keep doing what you're doing; it's working. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people are are um, kind of complaining about the GWN matches that they're too long. So mm -hmm. if you're listening to this. <laughs> You know, I think I encourage you guys to keep um, to keep writing your thoughts on those because th that is taking up way too much time on the episode. And even though they're kind of fun at the same time, I did an upload about this about a month ago to where they're kind of a reminder. You, know, we, you and I talk about this all the time, man. It, it's just a reminder of the glory years. You know, th did you see how into that Feast of Fire match the crowd was? <laughs> and then compare it to tonight's crowd on Feast of Fire, you know, it's very hard to watch sometimes. Yeah, and then I, I want to say, I don't know around that time, I don't know if it was still new. It might have been relatively new. But yeah, you know, when you see it, and I see in the past couple of weeks what they've done, we've seen a mixture where some of the flashbacks have been people who are currently on the roster now, which is fine, but they don't, 
podcast, especially when you're talking about as far as matches, just show us bits and pieces, the beginning, middle, end. We don't need to see the full match. That's the whole point of uh, promoting the app, where if you want to see the match, us as fans, we can go to the app and see the full match. <laughs> exactly. They're giving away. <laughs> They're giving it away. Um, there's a big difference between tonight's Feast of Fired match and the one they just showed, because I think that one was on a pay-per-view, right? Yeah. So, so when you do it like that, you're able to, you know, actually build up to it. Like with this feast are fired, they, they announced the participations on Twitter. There was no, or participants, I'm sorry, on Twitter, you know, as far as the past episodes of impact, they weren't, you know, they weren't pushing this, this thing at all. And one thing I've, I've said a lot, and I've, I've actually been then uh, saying this when I fell at the surveys is that the impact zone crowd for all the shit people want to give them, they have no idea what's going on storyline. And that's part of what, what really kills how they come off. Like even for instance, tonight, the uh, spiritual guide thing. Um, how many times has Matt, Matt Seidel cut a promo in the ring talking about the spiritual guide up, up to this point? I mean, did the crowd even know what the hell that was? You know, he had, it wasn't so much, I don't want to say promos, but he did a few backstage segments. But I don't think people were really catching on to it. Because even um, when one thing I was bringing up to Adam, I said, we're seeing this slow hill turn with him. It's really slow because he's still getting chant chanted, you know. In his match against Ishimori, there were chants for him. So I think people aren't really kind of getting a gist of things up, up until now. Yeah, they, they have, the, the crowd has no clue. And a couple times I've been in the impact zone, sometimes they'll play those segments over the on, on the Jumbotron, but they don't always do it. I think more often than not, they don't. So if you're building up the whole Matt Seidel, you know, my third eye and all that shit. But if you're doing it in the, uh, you know, in the indies or backstage segments, like the impact zone crowd doesn't know what's going on. Like when he's in there, I'm finally bringing on my spiritual guide, like. I mean, it was a fart in church because they didn't, they had no clue. <laughs> so that's something they really have to work on. And again, I've been saying this a lot on the surveys, but I think that's what killed tonight's feast or fire because I mean, granted the, the, the fans there know the rules, but I mean, there was no build. It was just like, they're sitting there at an impact show and all of a sudden feast or fired, you know, because say you're watching like raw or something like that. There's always second, even though like there's a shitload of talking, at least someone comes out and says, hey, tonight, this is going to happen for the number one contendership or this is for, you know what I'm saying? Like, they don't have anyone that does anything like that. And I think that's where sometimes an authority figure is kind of a good thing. If they just come out, hey, tonight's this and this, they're competing for this and this, you got to, you got to prepare the crowd. So, um, don't want to harp on it too much. Let's, let's, uh, let's get into the, the, uh, episode itself. So the very first match was Sammy Callahan versus Falaba. Can you believe how much Falaba was over from I mean the minute his music hit? Yeah, I I think it goes back to when they had the uh, gauntlet it was a gauntlet for gold match when he came out there was a sequence where his music kind of faded and uh, all you could hear is the fans chanting ba and I was you know I was taken aback by it so to see it now I'm not surprised. Does it do the ba in his music at all? No, no, I don't think so. It's him, and then it's a combination of him and um, the crowd. That's why um, when I texted you earlier, I said they should really, like, like once he gets into the ring, kind of fade his music out and just let, let the fans uh, chant ba. Like, it's, it gets really loud. Yeah, it's a missed opportunity to at least not have that in the music at, to some point, something that the crowd can actually chant along with if they're going to have music going. But, yeah, he was over, man. Like... <laughs> That shit was, was crazy. Even when he did the no, no, no. I mean, it was it was audibly loud of the crowd doing it with him. You were saying to me over text as well, what were you saying about his character, what they could, could be doing with it? I mean, I, I thought they could, you know, with him having that following, and then after seeing his match, I kind of just realized that maybe, at least right now, he's better served as a fan favorite. But I thought they could really make him be, you know, badass, you know, to have he comes out and, you know, no music. All you can hear is the fans chanting his name and stuff. But then, you know, some of his mannerisms in the ring would tell you otherwise. So I just kind of thought, that, you know, maybe they could make him be a badass. But... Right now, I think as a fan favorite, I think he fits well. 
it, it works. He he can't, you know, when he was a heel, he was all comedy and, and a character like that has to have a manager, has to have a mouthpiece. Like you can't just come out there and not talk, you know, like it's, um, or be unable to speak. Like that's why Congo Kong works with a manager. Cause he can't just come out by himself and no one knows what the hell's intentions are. So, um, but yes, Sammy Callahan right now, the most talked about guy in impact. He was on his fourth teleconference this week. When, uh, when I got the message that Sammy Callahan was going to be on the teleconference, I was like, again, like I was talking with Adam, <laughs> like what the, we don't even know what to ask him anymore. This is out of control, but yeah, that was his fourth one. And, um, most talked about guy in impact right now. I really, I do. I love the OVE presentation, the music, and it, it's, it's crazy because just a few months ago we couldn't stand OVE. Like, you know, this heel, the heel persona is just save them. I swear. And, Sammy Callahan's match with Eddie Edwards a couple weeks ago was absolutely excellent. And I actually thought this was this was pretty good, but Fala Ba actually got a lot of offense in here. Well, you know, I thought that was kind of important because even though, you know, I figured since uh, Callahan right now is the one that's been prominently featured, you know, he's going to take the win. But you didn't want him to just run through Fala Ba. I like to believe now with Ba, you know, we've seen the past few matches Ba's in, he's been getting a little bit more offense, which is good, you know, because he has, you know, a little bit of a following, you know, kind of, you know, I'm, I wouldn't mind you know, a little push for him if they were to decide to do that. But, you know, the right guy won. And, you know, I, I'm glad – with the whole OVE, the the push that they're getting, especially Callahan, because like you said, although I was a fan of them, you know, there was a lot of people who weren't supporters of them, and the heel turn and everything that's tr- led up to it till now, um, it's worked out well for them. I like the way Sammy won the match as well. Um, they said it was a Death Valley driver. It was kind of more of a Samoan draw, but I like the way he won it. Um, it was very impressive. He was able to pick him up. And uh, after the match, they tried to take out Falabad's eye, much like they did Eddie Edwards. And I actually thought someone like Moose or something was going to run down. I thought they were actually going to keep Eddie off TV, but he came down and his eye was messed up. Yeah, <laughs> it was uh, kind of scary looking. Jeez. I think they're doing a really good job with this feud, though. Um, you might as well roll roll with it with everything happening. And they just announced the I Quit match. It's going to be Eddie Edwards versus Jeremiah Crane at the uh, Impact versus Lucha Underground show. So that should, that should be good. Uh, some people have been saying, oh, they should have done this stipulation and this and this. I'm like, I think an I Quit match is good for a, a house show. You know. You think, I mean, wouldn't you, I mean, if, if I guess if I could be a little fantasy booker here, wouldn't that be the match that you have to blow off the feud? Because you would imagine, you know, Eddie Edwards back, going to want his retaliation should we get a couple more matches before we get that big stipulation match i mean yeah but th- there's there's bigger bigger stipulations that you could do than an i quit match i guess is where i'm going with it okay i see i see what you mean you know so um so after this we got a um a segment that impact shared this on their facebook and a lot of people are like you just wasted however <laughs> however many minutes of my life but it was the sit down interview. So I actually thought it was, you know, going to be a sit down interview with Mackenzie Mitchell talking about the book or whatever. The first thing I thought was Austin Aries is wearing this black polo in every single promo. You know, obviously, <laughs> obviously it was all done in the same day, but dude, is that the only shirt you brought? Like it's, it's very obvious. Um, it doesn't matter if he was talking in the, about Eli Drake when he was in that feud the uh, Johnny Impact one, and now this one with Alberto. It's the black polo every single time. So Impact's got to do a better job with that. That's absolutely ridiculous. But first thing, um, I thought Mackenzie, by the way, she looks, it's like she gets better looking every episode of Impact, I swear. Indeed, man. Oh, my Lord. Girl. But uh, I thought she's really has come a long way with these interviews. I mean, she sounded really good and really natural. Yeah, and you know, the good thing about it is she, she's essentially homegrown because you think about when, what, because she's been with the company now, what, go, going on almost two years, I want to say. And, uh, you know, she was just somebody who kind of appeared and, uh, you know, through times and, you know, getting the experience underneath their belt. Man, I mean, she's a natural now. 
Oh yeah. I'm sure she would cringe if she would look back at her old work. Uh, <laughs> it's just absolutely robotic. I didn't think she was ever going to come around, but she's doing a good job. So anyway, this whole segment where Aries was sitting down speaking, Alberto El Patron, I freaking loved it. I thought it was a little long. It kind of reminded me of Alberto coming out at bound for glory and talking about five to minutes too long. Like this motherfucker tried to give him steak like three times. <laughs> like <laughs> the first time, like we get it. He's like, okay, he doesn't want it. I'll eat it. Um, here's another bite, a, a, a bite full of fat, mind you, Ro. It was just like dripping, dripping with fat. So uh, what, definitely wasn't cooked too well. A little rare probably. But yeah, what do you think about this, dude? I, I actually, like I said, a little long for me, but I kind of thought it was funny. Yeah, I felt like it went on a little bit too long. I liked where they were headed at first, and then I took it. I'm like, all right, so he's going to go at Aries for, you know, being vegan, so he's going to taunt him with meat. I couldn't get over the fact that he was eating the meat, and the meat didn't look cooked out <laughs> whatsoever. I'm just looking at the red, and, like, I wanted to tweet so bad. I was like, I'll just save it for when we review. I'm like... Alberto's seriously trying to give this dude some uncooked meat, man, you know, but, rare. but, but, you know, to set it up and it, it just seemed like, like I said, it went on a little bit too long. It kind of, the way I was taking it, it, it seemed like they were running out of stuff on uh, El Patron's end. But I think Aries in this, um, interview he delivered, I mean, man, like, you know, even though I was critical for them putting the belt on him right away, but you know, ever since then, like his his mic work and even the matches, man, he's been delivering. So he's been doing anything, everything I ask for for a champion. I would imagine that Alberto was uh, was raised with better etiquette than to eat with his mouth open like that. <laughs> but overall, no, I I thought it was I thought it was good. It was just again, he just kept coming back with the meat. Um, what did Aries say? Like, if you want <laughs> something, you want to put meat in your mouth or. I, I didn't catch everything, but it just seemed like because, you know, he they, he kept resorting to the meat El Patron was. And then I think he just said, if you want to keep putting meat in your mouth, fine. But I'll, I, I something about I know the one big thing and what got El Patron uh, triggered was when he was talking about uh, when El Patron was saying, here, I'll buy a book. He said, I don't need your money. He's like, I get money from carrying this belt around. You know, remember when you used to have this? And that's what got El Patron kind of going, which I thought was a. Uh, you know, nice little jab. I thought so too. Um, the sex, the sexual innuendos were out of control here. I mean, the mouthful of meat, um, Aries putting the uh, banana in his mouth. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know, out of control. Uh, why did Alberto get like in the fetal position on the, on the sofa? <laughs> you know, what I'm I, talking I about like when when Aries got up, he kind of like curled <gasps> up like my kid would. Oh, because uh, when he was putting the meat in Aries' face and Aries kind of just stepped up to him and then El Patron, which I didn't understand because if El Patron was the hill white, well, I guess you do, but he that's when he uh, he backed off. I was looking for El Patron to attack him, whether it was with the uh, the plate or hit him with the meat or hit him with the bottle. I was looking for that and we didn't get that. Slap him with the meat. Slap him with his meat. <laughs> But speaking of talking way too long, we've been talking way too long on this segment, but I, I will just close by saying I actually like that there wasn't a brawl because that would have been the, the really safe thing to do. Oddly enough, this segment led to the world title match at Redemption. So <laughs> later they announced that this was the main event. I was like, based off the sit down with the meat and the banana and the book, all good. It's, it's whatever, um, but that'll be the main event. And again, I kind of enjoyed it. Uh, Ali had a segment backstage with Kira Hogan and and uh, Braxton Sutter. I don't know if I like this dynamic they're giving Kira Hogan where she's almost trying to mirror Allie's personality. There was a one night only several months ago where Allie had a backstage segment with Ava Story. And Ava can do that very well, actually. Like, they actually played off each other really well. And they're trying to do that with Kira where they're besties and kind of cutesy. I don't really care for it. Um... But I liked Braxton trying to get her back. <laughs> yeah, I'm just glad that they're, you know, using, they're following up with uh, Braxton's character because they could have easily just done a one off. And, you know, I'm interested to see where they go with him and how they tie him into Allie and Allie's uh, title reign. But as far as Kira Hogan, 
I mean, I don't know what to think right now because, you know, it's relatively new. You know, got a couple matches underneath her belt. I mean, they can go either way. You can have her be, you know, this, you know, I admire Ali type persona or you could have her, you know, turn heel. You know, try to fake like you're, you know, you're friends with Ali and then end up turning on her. So we just have to see how it plays out. I liked uh, he called her Boo because um, when I was speaking to Ali, actually not too long ago, after it was after the, uh, I think it was after, um, I was listening to one of his podcasts. And I was talking to her. She was a guest on it. And uh, he was saying he hates calling her Allie. And I had asked her about that. I was like, does he he doesn't like calling you Allie or by your first name. He's like, no, he only calls me Boo. Like, he's, he hasn't called me by my name in forever. So he doesn't like referring to her by her name in any way whatsoever, apparently. So it was kind of cool that they brought some of the on life, I mean, uh, real life on screen there. One thing I want to say about Braxton because uh, obviously I haven't been able to talk about Impact the last few weeks, is that I really like what they did last week, and or I think it wasn't last week, but the week before. There was good humor with the heel turn, but instead of Brian Cage coming out and squashing him, I think he should have done more like the new inmate thing, going and walking up and slapping the biggest bully in the yard. Like I would have seen, I'd like to see Braxton like attack Brian Cage and maybe lead to a match so that he'd be Bra- uh, Brian Cage's first opponent, but that way we could take him a little bit serious. But we'll see. Yeah, you, yeah, and you know what? It would have helped too because eventually, with Brian Cage, <clears throat> excuse me, you're gonna have to have him start facing, you know, actual guys. As I want to say, with the past few has just been um, enhancement guys. So you know, you can have him face Braxton. You, and you can run through Braxton, but at least it's somebody that we know is on the ra- roster, somewhat credible. So next segment, um, you know, speaking of long talking segments, we get Jimmy Jacobs and Congo Kong. Uh, basic, basically calling out Abyss once again. And this has actually been my favorite part about Impact lately. I've really been enjoying the storyline, especially because I'm loving what Jimmy Jacobs is doing. And they kind of do the you know same thing that they do every week. Father James Mitchell comes out, and he cuts a hell of a promo. Very long. The people were into it, thank God. You know, he wasn't losing them by any stretch of the imagination, but a, a little long. And that was just kind of the theme of the episode. Every time someone got on the mic, it was just like two, three minutes too much. He basically said that, um, you know, he thanked him because he, he brought his son back. He brought abyss back the real abyss and abyss comes down and long story short, they are setting up a monsters ball match next month. We haven't seen monsters ball since bound for glory. And prior to that, we hadn't seen it in a while either, but it wasn't that long ago that the abyss was wrestling in a monster's ball match, like every single match. And it kind of lost its, uh, lost its steam, but this should be good. Uh, Congo Kong said on the heel cast in the, in the interview that this is his favorite match he's done with impact. So I think this is going to be pretty good. what do you think about all this? I loved the promo from uh, James Mitchell. I will say this while I'm looking forward to this, because this gives Congo Kong his really first big feud since he's arrived in impact um i hope after all this they decide to retire the abyss character because seeing him coming down like he seen he looks so compromised I, I don't know if you caught that or maybe it was just me i did you know but he, he but he doesn't move the same way so it does have me wonder what quality of match we're going to be getting you know compared to obviously we know you know abyss for 10 years ago you know you gave us some great matches so that was just my thing but the promos that was some great great stuff yeah i hope they retire him as well because just the character in general he's an original but abyss is not what am i trying to say here he's not intimidating when he comes out anymore i mean that that's like way it's kind of like the kane character like kane comes yeah, out who the fuck cares thinking. you know like abyss has kind of reached that level too and he he recreated himself with with decay um but after that i mean it's it was a nice good it was a feel good moment he came out and i'm excited for the match and we got jimmy jacobs and freaking james mitchell cutting promos i mean that's that's absolutely magical would you say that uh, Chandler Parks is probably written off TV now? See, I don't know because that's what I've been asking, you know, the past uh, reviews. I'm like, where does he play a role in this? I mean, for one, is he 
is he signed to, to, with the company or was he just working, you know, an appearance, you know, pay per appearance or whatever? Because, you know, we don't hear. I mean, they mentioned made some mentions of him, but, you know, I don't see where he fits in now. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think he's going for going forward. He's part of the company at all. I really don't. It, I mean, to have that successful of an indie star come in to do that role is pretty crazy. You know, you could you could have just grabbed anybody to do that, um, but to use him and he probably you know paid him more than they really needed to. Mm -hmm. So very strange, but I definitely think he's he's completely written off. Knockouts action: we get Taya versus Rosemary, and man, Taya's entrance is is great. She seems to do it differently every time, but um, she looks she looked great too. I texted you like because I saw I saw before you. I was like you. Wait till you see Taya tonight. <laughs> Good lord, boy. Yeah. You know, I tell you, I am uh I'm one of those people I really like thin women. You know, some people like meat on the bones and everything. I I personally don't. Um but she looks a lot better like this than she did previously with the six pack and all that on Lucha Underground. But I think she said she was going through a lot of depression at the time and now she's actually happy and comfortable in her skin. But she looks a lot better now. Yeah. I mean, you know, everybody has, you know, what they like and stuff and what they consider healthy. But, you know, when I compare, she looks fine, you know, fine the way she is. And as far as this match, if, if I can go first, you know, I, it was fine. What I really wanted, because we've seen, even when you think back le leading up to what we were supposed to get at Bound for Glory, you know, we've always seen Taya get the upper hand on rosemary so i kind of thought with this one i mean going the double count out I, it was a safe thing to do i really would have liked even if you would have given and i know you don't like it if you would have given rosemary a, a roll-up or, or something of that you could still continue the feud i wanted to see rosemary kind of get some kind of comeuppance on her yeah we definitely got different opinions on that i, I i'm of the old school mindset make the heel look as strong as possible up until the big match, which I would imagine will probably be the you know eventual red wedding match. Rosemary has two victories over Hanaya. Um, they weren't you know the hardest fought victories in the world, but you know she beat her twice, so I don't think she needed the win. I was glad they did a non finish because I'm I'm not a fan of fifty fifty booking. I'm not I don't like back and forth, and I I'm more invested in wanting to see Rosemary get that eventual comeuppance instead of. Going back and forth. I mean, if Rosemary would have got the upper hand this week, uh, what is do Taya going to come out next week and challenge her to a red wedding match? I mean, it's the red wedding is is more like Rosemary challenge her, challenging her. Like that's it's it's supposed to come from her. So yeah, yeah, I, I see where you come from. I guess you know what I was just looking at it like with this whole feud and stuff. And I guess, you know, with Taya being the heel, you're saying that the, the heel should be dominant. But I just wanted to see one time Rosemary, even you think post-match, you know, if Rosemary would have hit that spear or something, that would have been nice. Instead, you know, it's Rosemary uh, getting slammed to the ramp again. So Eli Drake is on the phone and calls Chris Adonis. How good was the acting in this? Because you know he was talking to nobody. I mean, he, he really <laughs> delivered this. This was masterful, and no pun intended. And I was happy they actually wrote him off TV instead of just acting like we're idiots and him not showing up. Yeah, and this was a creative way to do it, too. I mean, you know, unfortunately, with a lot of departures, we still have to see them on our TV screen. So this was a unique way where they, you know, decided, hey, you know, no longer going to be using you and they wrote them out, wrote them off correctly. So, yeah, I, I liked it. it was smooth. So EC3 does a backstage interview with Mackenzie Mitchell and he's got, <laughs> if you couldn't tell, uh, his shirt was this picture of his cat just like plastered all over. And that's a new company that he was promoting on Facebook not long ago that where you can put your pets on your clothes. So that, that was what the uh, strange shirt was. So then we get the meeting between Bobby Lashley and Brian Cage. Brian Cage is, again, you know, brushing him off. Lashley does a pretty good job here in uh, what he what he said. Um, he, when they were talking, I was thinking to myself was, we haven't seen a good big man match like this in wrestling in a while. Not two, like, muscle guys. 
you know, obviously we're going to get uh, Abyss versus Congo Kong, two, two big old fat dudes. But to get like a match like this, two muscle guys, we haven't seen nothing like this. And Lord knows how long. And these guys can both work too. But do you like the whole cage thing where he's not speaking and just kind of – do you think that's working or, or – or? I prefer that, to, at least right now, because that was the one thing I was worried about. I was like, don't have him talk right now. Just wait. Because, you know, he's still relatively new. You, would, you figure he's only had, what, two or three matches. I forgot that the tag match he participated in at Crossroads. But – you know, we don't need to hear him speak. Not everyone needs to speak. I don't know how he is on the mic. You know, I'm not saying you know, he's a bad talker or whatever the case may be. But uh, just keep him quiet. I think that's cool. He's like Kawhi Leonard. I've never heard him speak. <laughs> yeah, no, they well, cool, well, they put a microphone in Kawhi's face. Kawhi talks now, but I know what you, I know what you're saying though. In the grand scheme, yeah, it's one of those things. Like, damn, we've been watching this guy for a long time. Never heard him speak. So. They have a LAX Clubhouse segment. I like how they do this to keep LAX kind of re- you know relevant every show, and that's kind of it's kind of like what they did with Braxton too, where they weren't going to devote all this time to him, but you at least kind of get that guy on camera or that team on camera, so they're not forgotten about because Ali and LAX are champions, so they should have some kind of role on the show, even if it's thirty seconds. You know, we shouldn't forget that they exist, especially since Ali won last week. You know, so good, uh, good little segment with LAX. At first, I thought it was their way of uh, trying to kick Homicide out of the group or something, and then I, then I kind of realized it was they were just messing around. But those guys are all really, really good actors too. So we get another really long talking segment here, and this is Matt Seidel uh, letting us know who his spiritual guide is, a spiritual advisor. Unfortunately, I had this spoiled for me a long time ago. I had almost everything spoiled for me for this set of tapings that you can imagine. Um, I would have liked to have not been spoiled for this one. And I think a lot of people got spoiled because when he gave Josh Matthews the grand championship, that was the news that got all over the internet. Oh my God, they booked Josh Matthews to be the champion instead of like really looking at the storyline. But what did you think of Josh Matthews coming out as a spiritual advisor? I thought they did a good job of him leaving the announce booth. Um, you heard him like put his headset down and, and, um, Props to Sanjay. Sanjay was incredible during this segment. What would you make of yeah, it? All? Yeah, that's where I was going to go at first. I, I thought his commentary was amazing. He's like, this idiot. He's going to, he's the one and stuff. But um, you know what? Here, Here's my thing. And I, we just move forward because, and I spoke with Adam about this. I don't know for you, but this commentary team starting to grow on me. And if you if you remove Josh from out of the booth, then essentially you're going to have to put somebody else in and then have to start up, you know, and create new chemistry again with Sanjay and whomever else you replace him with. But um, with that said, I mean, I mean, I, I, have, I don't really have too much of a comment of it. I mean, I'm sure the, it's going to get a lot of backlash for, you know, they put the belt on or they just gave the belt to Josh, the grand championship. The belt must not mean anything. But um, I'm interested to see where it goes from here. I'm pretty sure they're just writing the title off TV. You think? Yeah, I think that I think that was the whole point to it um, was giving it to him, and he's going to go down as the last grand champion. I don't think he's going to like defend it or anything crazy like that. I, I think it, I think they're just getting it off TV, or not off TV, but just I mean, eventually off TV. But I think that that was their way of getting out get, getting out from under it. Uh, I mean, you know, in I could see it like that. I don't know. I'm, I I have so much, so many mixed feelings about it. Because on one end, I look at it as like, all right, they're gonna scrap it. Then it looks like, hey, you know, they're gonna actually, you know, especially since they changed the rules and whatnot, actually treat this as a mid card belt. But I guess we just have to see. But maybe you're right. I mean, I, that that'd probably be the best way to write the championship off, putting it on him. Yeah, and it gives Josh Matthews a little bit of heat, and we finally get the heel manager, Josh, Josh Matthews. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if he finishes up the uh, set of tapings. I like how they had to kick off the night with JB <laughs> um, <laughs> doing the backstage segment. That was funny. Obviously, they couldn't uh, do anything about that. But I would imagine Josh is going to finish up the set of tapings with uh, Sanjay. And then I think Josh is going to be getting out of the booth at that point. But this, this goes back to my point earlier. I don't think the crowd knew what was going on. 
one thing too is when he when he had his uh, spirit animal mask, he wore that to the last Chancery show, I think. I, I unfortunately I haven't been able to catch that. Uh, Twitch was acting up with me the day I tried to go on go on it. I it went to the Tyler Dukes match and then I couldn't advance, so I didn't unfortunately didn't get to see the show. Yeah, he came out with a mask, and I was kind of like, "What the hell is that?" Um, so I'm 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 curious to see what they do with this because if we get Josh Matthews the heel the heel manager and for someone like Seidel, I mean that's very different. But I think Seidel's doing a really good job. Uh, just sounding very eccentric and just the, the sh- you know, just the delivery of his words. And I think he's doing a good job of it. And I think it can it can really work as a heel. So after this is the uh, the main event is the Feast or Fired match. So we haven't got Feast or Fired in a couple years. Uh, the last one we got, the uh, the winners were Drew Galloway, Grado, uh, James Storm, and Eli Drake. So that one was funny because you look, you looked at the four guys who got the briefcases and you knew exactly what they all drew. You know, obviously then we're going to fire uh, James Storm or Eli Drake or Drew Galloway. I mean, it was just <laughs> so ridiculous. But yeah, they got they got to they got to come out do a better job of being a little bit more creative with them, I think, because you know, with the the three briefcases that contained the title shots, I mean, those ones, you know, you essentially sometimes don't know who's going to get what. But with the fired one, you can, like, you look at the four who win and, like, you can be, like, right away, like, okay, this person got the pink slip. So I think in the future, if they're going to continue to continue the Feast or Fired match, try to be a little bit more creative. Yes, absolutely. And you remember last year we got the race for the case. And I don't, I've never hated anything in Impact Wrestling. Like, I hated that ser- – that – um briefcase i guess ceremony you want to call it when they did it on the fact of life do you remember oh yeah yeah i remember i've not hated anything like i've hated that that was the worst thing i've ever seen in my life um i had i damn near had nightmares over it when you know dcc (laughs) had the the smiley masks and it was all comedy and you know that had this really has a chance to be like their money in the bank and last year they dropped the ball on it so badly and uh, the previous year, I, I remember I was there when Drew Galloway cashed in, and it was um, it was a big deal. And I got on TV, too, because I was one of the people that ran up to him when he was in the crowd with the belt. And uh, I was carrying my, uh, I guess he was about six at the time, my son, and I left my other son, <laughs> who was probably like four at the time. <laughs> I left him sitting by himself. <laughs> but, uh, you know, people were like, whoa, father of the year over there. But, yeah, this has an opportunity to be, a much bigger deal than it is. And I really hope this time around they do a better job with it. And, you know, I don't mind them biting off money in the bank a little bit, but money in the bank is a big freaking deal. They have to make this a big deal too. Um, you know, last year they did again, that race for the case and the matches were so stupid. That was, Oh my God. I don't, I don't you know, I don't I don't want to be negative. So I I'm going to uh, find my chi, uh, open my third eye. And not uh, not think about all that because I was last year and this is this year. But you know, I'm I'm gonna admit when when uh, Josh Matthews said to do it, I was doing it at home. I had my hands together. <laughs> Did not, absolutely nothing for me. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> what I was gonna say, I did feel with this particular Feaser Fire, it felt a little bit rushed and really the thing that stuck out to me was the ending, uh the shine where uh, Eli, that spot where Eli did where he just kinda just gave everyone the gravy train and it made Eli look great and that's that's the one thing my biggest takeaway is they have big plans for Eli. So, you know, any concerns about him, you know, getting lost in the shuffle or whatever, like, nah, he's the guy. Yeah, he, he was really, really impressive at the end here. And he really dropped KM on his head with that uh, gravy train. And, man, that spot where he jumped to the top rope and back suplexed uh, Trevor Lee, that was amazing. Yeah. And, I, you know, to go what you said earlier where they have to be a little more creative, I actually thought Lee or Conley was going to win a briefcase for sure. It was kind of like, you know, as aforementioned, when I say James Storm won it, it was like, okay, obviously that dude's going to challenge for the tag team titles. Yeah, it, you know, the only one that came across is probably, you could say, random 
is uh, P.D. Williams because I, I thought, you know, he was just with the company for a short time. I didn't even know he was still, you know, around. But, you know, oh, we saw Moose get a briefcase. We saw Eli get a briefcase and we seen EC3 and we all can assume what EC3 got, you know, and that's that's kind of been the thing that's followed this match the past couple of years. They've used it as a tool where if there's somebody departing the company, you know who's getting the pink slip. And I get it, but that's their way of writing somebody off. Yeah, um, I, I will bet my left testicle that P.D. Williams is going to have the X Division briefcase. I'm sure, yeah. of, sure of that. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think back when they first they first did it. Um, wasn't one of the briefcases? I'm sorry, someone keeps texting. Um, wasn't one of the briefcases? It wasn't the X Division. It was something else. Well, it was the mid card title. So. I want to say it used to be the tag, the uh, whatever the hell the mid-card title was, and the world title, because the X Division doesn't always make sense, because anyone could grab that. No, you know what? The only time it was a mid-card one, it was the one, because Eli's won this thing, I don't know, is this his third or second time? Because I remember he won once, th yeah, this got to be his third, because he got a title, a world title shot one time, and then one time he got the, where they had it, it was the King of the Mountain title. So he had a shot at that. <laughs> You're right. And then now he, he gets a briefcase now. So he, this is his third time. This dude's killing And he's won the last two gauntlet for golds too. Oh, that's nice. His, that initial one where he won the title, to me, that was my favorite match of last year by far, man. Yeah, absolutely. And because remember, he won the year before at Bound for Glory. Okay, yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, you're so right. he's won well, two of those. Wasn't that Tyrus? Did Tyrus win a title shot one time? Too? Or no, that wasn't Gauntlet for Gold. I'm confused. Well, it was, it was Gauntlet for Gold, but it was at Bound for Glory 2015. Okay. And then Eli Drake won the next one, and then he won the title, and then he's you know got a briefcase of the last three events. So, the uh, yeah, the first time he had the King of the Mountain match, because remember he stole it from Grado. He actually pulled the, the fired one, and then he swapped it out with Grado. They showed the yeah, backstage segment. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> and then... Uh, in the race for the case last year, he got the briefcase and he had to pick the last match and he just challenged EC3 to a normal match, which was so, oh my God. Again, let me find my chi. I remember Drew Galloway defended the grand championship in a random squash match earlier in the night, so they couldn't even use that for the briefcases. Oh my God, terrible. Oh, but anyway, so Eli Drake wins a case, Moose, Matt Seidel, and EC3. So it's, it's, um, Next week will be the the ceremony uh, where they have to open the cases, and um, we pretty much all know how that's going to play out for the most part. But still looking forward to it, and I'm looking forward to getting EC3 off TV. I personally think he has been phoning it in like a mother on TV. Um, yep. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it's so hard to watch, and there's there's some people who disagree, but I think it's so hard to watch. You see a difference, like you look at LVN when when we knew or when she had put in given her release. Like, had you not been aware of that, you wouldn't have thought twice. Whereas in EC threes, like, you know, he just is like he just checked out comp entirely, man. So when I was see him on the TV, I'm just like, uh, you know, kind of like I think you had mentioned when we knew Loki was departing. It's kind of the same thing. Like, get this guy off our TV. Oh my God, yeah. And I did an upload on the channel, man, back in, uh, it was right after Bound for Glory. And I, I had received some information that he was pretty disgruntled. So I, I knew ahead of the time, ahead of time, basically, that he didn't want to be there anymore. He he pretty much clashed with, with the new management, with um, Anthem and all that. And he was just one of those guys like the Hardys that they, they came in and told Dixie Carter what they were going to do. And new management came in and told the top guys, okay, it's not going to be like that now. You know, you don't run this company. I do. And, you know, that's why a lot of the top guys left. They, they really clashed with, with Ed Norholm. And EC3 was one that did. And um, shout out to, gosh, I don't remember your name. Um, <laughs> there was a guy I was talking to him on Instagram. He, uh, he's a, either a Lyft or an Uber driver. And EC3 got in his vehicle he actually drove him, I think, to the uh, NXT show. <laughs> okay. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, he sent me the picture. They took a picture together, and 
he promised EC3 he wouldn't spoil it. And uh, he had he had said that, um, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but he said that there's talks about Dixie being his manager in NXT, but I'm kind of like, I think, I think EC3 might have been blowing smoke up your ass there because... I don't think he would divulge that information and Dixie's still an owner of the, you know, a minor minority owner. And I don't think they would go to that route for the NXT brand. I mean, you never know. I mean, that if anything, that just lets you know what they think of him. I mean, they sought after him that hard, but then feel that they need to put some kind of manager with him. I mean, cause I, last thing I seen, I seen something uh, earlier today, I guess he's, a part of some tournament i think they're creating a mid-card title for for um whatever that brand is but so i guess he's going to be a part of it it wouldn't surprise me to see him win but no hats off to him i mean look i thought you know for him being disgruntled while i could understand i felt with under dixie he probably benefited the most i mean this guy was undefeated for a year got two title reigns got to beat kurt angle and you know some other you know, legendary Sting, people. Yeah. Sting. So, you know, it's, I, I think in, while I always heart, go back to like Eli and Rosemary, like you see, even if they're not in the title picture, they find ways to be, you know, make themselves still seem like a big deal working up and down the card. Even if it's side fuse, they they don't have to be surrounded near the title. Or if they're put in a program, like say in Eli's case, where he's challenging for a mid card belt, you know, he's not going to, take it as a demotion you know it's just part of the job but overall pretty solid show um i could see why some people maybe didn't care for it just because the you know the talking segments were out of control just way too long but they were good segments and then i had no problem with the the matches at all i thought the matches were were all done really well it's very hard to follow up what they did last week because that that show was amazing but to uh, to hammer back your point, uh, hammer home your point, I said about the GWN, you know, they show that entire Feast of Fire thing. And, you know, they didn't even show the opening the, when they open the briefcases. You might as well at that point show us when they open the cases. If we're going to sit through that the whole damn match. Yeah, and he, because uh, in part of, I don't know if you caught it, but in the main event, Sanjay had mentioned how he was in the match and, oh, you can go on the network and, you know, watch the whole match. It's like you pretty much showed us the whole match during the broadcast. So they, you know, if they're going to do these flashbacks, I don't mind them, but don't, don't use it as essentially a, a match like you think about it that time they dedicated to that that could have been a segment that could have been another match i mean it could have been a whole bunch of things so it, it, sometimes it could come across as filler you you know i don't know if you caught this there was a there was kind of a rule change so with the I, I, and i thought the chains looked a lot better than the way had it, they had it this time but you remember back then you had to you had to touch the ground yeah yeah they changed it. Yeah, I they, did, they didn't do that this time. Um, and that can add a little bit more drama to it. You know, like the way they ended the match where Shelly and uh, – what's his name? Uh, Saban. Yeah, Saban and Shelly, how they were, you know, celebrating. And then I don't even remember who grabbed it. Was it Sanjay? No. Nah, um, Black Machismo. Oh, Black Machismo, they did. Yeah, yeah he, uh, he, jumped, he jumped from the rope and uh, took it. Does Sanjay not look like a jabroni with hair? Like – <laughs> oh my god man every time they show him i mean like an absolute jobber uh but you know i like what he's become now like really him as a commentator and it's crazy because you know first couple of weeks i wasn't really paying too much attention to the commentary but he's really grown on me man and i, I hope they keep him around because even though you know he's not he doesn't play the hill i like the comedy factor and like uh, a lot of his pop culture references it just it, it's funny yeah, it's different. Um, you know, you watch some other shows, man, and they're still saying, whoop, there it is, and talking about real old school shit, and not the good kind of old school either. Um, what's up? What's up? <laughs> I remember, uh, man, uh, I don't even I don't even know if he's with the company anymore or whatever, but JBL, when he was in the booth, would always say, get, get jiggy with it. I'm like, dude, oh, that wasn't man. even cool when it was cool. Right. You know, so it is kind of a breath of fresh air to someone who actually knows what the hell is going on. So, uh, but no, they've been doing a good job. So, oh man, that's going to do it for us this week, folks. Uh, you got anything closing row on this? Um, you want to just do a rundown of 
the matches for next week? I do. Um, I actually was going to do that. Um, thank you for reminding me. So next week, not only are they going to be opening the briefcases, but we're going to get Monsters Ball, Abyss versus Congo Kong. And again, I'm excited because the, the promos have been good. And Congo Kong said this is his favorite match. And th- this is the match where Congo Kong really needs to deliver. Because, you know, big guys don't get over, you know, these days like, like uh, you know, 20 years ago. So he really needs to deliver. And he needs to win this match too. And then we're getting a knockouts, random knockouts title match from Sienna, um, who hasn't been featured the entire set of tapings, taking on Ali. So, got any thoughts on uh, next week's show? Um, I'm really interested to see the Monster Ball match because, like you said, we need, really need to see you know this this match in particular for Congo Kong. This is going to determine what's next because the one thing or part of James Storm's promo, I mean James Storm, I'm sorry, James Mitchell's promo, he mentioned you know leading uh, the Monster Abyss to a world title. So, and I'm not saying that you know, that's where they're headed with Congo Kong, but we need to see some kind of progression. What's next for him. So this match can really make or break his character. So I'm interested to see how it goes. Any thoughts on the random knockouts title match? Didn't like that. I I really, I really didn't like, I felt you could, I mean, they, I guess with this company, the rematch clause is just, (laughs) is irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know what? It, yeah, I mean, I would have rather it be a non-title, you know, maybe you have Sienna come out, call her out, but just to see a random title defense like that, but it is what it is. Yeah, and you know Sienna's going to lose, so, I, I, yeah, I don't care for that either. The last thing I want to say, how good was Sanjay on commentary by himself during the first half of that Feast or Fire match? Yeah, you know, he did. He did fine. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I thought you were talking about we're gonna go go back to when he was talking when uh, Josh was revealed as a spiritual. Yeah, that, was ph- that was phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, but no, he's been doing an amazing job, and I mean, I know, I mean, I don't think he's retired. He hasn't retired or anything, right? He's just not he, wrestling. He's just at hurt. Yeah. Oh, um, but like I said, he's been doing some great work, man, and I like, I like him, you know, being being there. So, but no, he did, he did great. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't as good as when Josh was in the ring, but just the fact that someone with no prior experience got in there and was able to do the match by himself for that long, got to give him props for that. And, uh, you know, Josh came back, came in, you know, halfway through. So, yeah, really good job. But that's going to do it for us this week, folks. Um, please hit subscribe, whatever your platform you're uh, streaming us on. We really appreciate that. And we will definitely talk to you guys next time. Peace.